Hello everyone, happy Friday. Welcome to another edition of Brain Scratch. I'm your host, John Lorden. Have you ever watched two people arguing and became increasingly frustrated by the fact that they couldn't stay on point? They start arguing over semantics or they start taking up indefensible positions that they just won't get off of and get back to what the core issue was? Well, welcome to today's Brain Scratch. This case is probably one of the most difficult that I've had to research specifically for that reason, and that even includes having a researcher helping me on this. So first of all, I'd like to give a big thank you to Casey Jane for sending this information in. She did a really good job of compiling a lot of info. It's just frustrating when you start looking through this info and it keeps taking you away from the core issue, and that's what we have going on here. As a matter of fact, this case has many people arguing on both sides of it uh, all over New Zealand and certain parts of the world. I'm hoping to help um, spread that to other parts. So yeah, if you want to argue with someone about this, it might be my fault. Let me apologize in advance. It's a very tough case and I wish it was about these two people right here, uh, Ben Smart and Olivia Hope. But unfortunately, you'll see once this case actually was brought to trial and these two missing people were deemed dead, um, the case becomes much more about a gentleman named Scott Watson. Let's jump right into this and see what we can find and see if we can really figure out what might have happened to these two young people. Olivia Hope arrived at Furno Lodge in the Marlboro Sounds on the afternoon of December 31st, 1997. The 17 year old Blenheim student had just finished college and was working at a winery over holidays. Along with her older sister, Amelia, and a group of friends, she chartered a yacht, Tamarack, for a few days, with the New Year's party at Furno being the highlight. Ben Smart was 21 and had been living in Christchurch but knew Olivia socially. He'd driven to Punga Cove in his Mini and had been partying with mates before catching a boat across to Furnell Lounge for the renowned celebrations. Scott Watson had set out from Picton that morning on his yacht Blade and arrived at Furno mid-afternoon. Watson, 26, had grown up living on board his family's yacht, had owned boats himself, and had built Blade in the backyard of his parents' Picton home. Sounds like everyone's just going out for a good time, trying to enjoy their New Year's Eve and usher in 1998. But unfortunately, uh, something very bad goes wrong in all of this. Jumping over to wikipedia.org. Ben Smart and Olivia Hope were last seen in the early hours of New Year's Day, the 1st of January, 1998, by water taxi driver Guy Wallace, who transported them to a moored yacht in Endeavour Inlet off Furno Lodge located in the Marlboro Sounds, New Zealand. The close friends had been celebrating New Year's Eve at the lodge with other partygoers. After leaving the party and discovering that the boat they had arrived on, Tamarack, was overcrowded, they decided to look for alternative accommodation for the night. They transferred from Tamarack to a Fernell Lodge water taxi driven by Wallace, intending to go back ashore. Aboard the small water taxi was a man who would later become crucial to the police investigation. According to Wallace and another couple who also rode in the water taxi, the man offered Ben and Olivia a place to stay aboard what he said was his vessel, which Wallace described as a two-masted catch. The pair accepted the offer and all three boarded the boat at a time estimated between 4 a.m. and 5 a.m. It was the last time the pair were seen. Police speculated that they had been murdered, but no bodies were found despite extensive searching in the months that followed. To this day, Smart and Hope remain missing. In the following months, police came to believe that the unidentified man was Scott Watson, although his yacht was not a two-masted catch. Police charged Watson with murder, and after an 11-week trial, he was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment. Watson still claims his innocence, however, after fruitless efforts, all avenues of appeal have failed. So, bit of an interesting story here. You have uh, a young couple trying to get back to their boat where uh, at least Olivia had a spot supposedly rented for her to sleep there for the night. They get to the boat and there's literally just people sleeping all over this place. She gets her things 
and they decide to get on the water taxi again. They actually talk to Guy Wallace about are there any accommodations back at the lodge and Guy's very clear with them. He's like, hey, this is New Year's Eve. Everything is sold out. You're not going to find any accommodations there. And that's when this mysterious gentleman um, offers his boat. Now, initially, he does not offer it to both of them. He kind of makes this joke that only Olivia can come aboard. And despite that, um, her and Ben do get to his boat and depart on his boat. Now, I know I've said a two-masted catch. I actually had to look that up, uh, what that meant when I initially started looking into this uh, case. And a catch is literally that. It's a, a sailboat that has two separate masts on it. And that's important because the boat known as Blade that Scott Watson had brought was what is known as a sloop or a single-masted much smaller type of boat. And um, it's pretty interesting. There are two, what I would consider, really good documentaries on it. One of them you can find the first half of on YouTube, so I'll be sure to include that in the links below. Uh, I believe it's called Murder on the Blade, if I recall correctly. And one of the big things is the water taxi driver really noticed this boat, this catch, as they were uh, riding up to it because of how nice it was. He noted that there was um, portals on the side of it that had um, brass around them that was really beautifully done and uh, rope work that was really ornate as well as a thick blue stripe down the side of it. Now Scott Watson's blade uh, does not have a blue stripe. It has a cabin on top that has some red paint on it and definitely no, um, no portholes as well as no rope work on it. And outside of that, just uh, deboarding from the water taxi to that type of boat is much different than deboarding from the water taxi to the type of boat that Scott had. Essentially, Scott's boat is extremely low to the water. You don't have to step up very high to get onto it. And a two-masted catch, which is a much larger boat, about 35 to 40 feet long, um, had a significant height difference, up to three or four feet difference from where the water taxi was in the water. So you needed someone to essentially help hold on to the side of that boat, and then people had to step up significantly or climb up onto that boat. So. Uh, it's pretty interesting to me that this becomes such a big point of contention in this court case, but essentially uh, law enforcement just decides that there is no two-masted catch and everyone is misremembering this. Now, there is another documentary that has actually just come out over the past few weeks. It's called Doubt the Scott Watson Case, I believe, or it might be the Scott Watson story. I'm going to do a Itchy Mysteries review on that next week. Um, but it's available in New Zealand right now. It is also available on YouTube. When I do the review, I'll be sure to include links in that description box for it. But you should really check that out because they have a lot of witnesses that are talking about seeing this specific two-masted catch with a blue stripe, with the brass uh, portals on the side of it. Um, it's, it's kind of striking when you see so many different people that claim that they saw that and the police have just completely disregarded it. Now, I did see some evidence from the police. One was a picture uh, of the marina supposedly taken at, uh, at, on New Year's, I think the morning of New Year's, and the, you can't see that boat anywhere in the picture. Um, I did see some analysis from people that said that picture is actually cutting off a significant part of the water and if it just would have led to the left a little more you would have seen where that boat was actually moored. Um, but it's pretty weird to me that you have an event like New Year's Eve going on where I assume a lot of people are going to have cameras even though considering this is you know back in the late 90s. Uh, disposable cameras were certainly all around back then and outside of that you're out partying with your friends. I think a lot of people would want to remember that. Um, and I still have not seen any photographic evidence of this other mystery boat. But there are many, many people that claim to have seen the boat. And these are people that have boats of their own. Um, some of them are builders, some of them are designers, so they noted very specific things about that boat. Now when it comes to uh, Scott Watson, he is certainly no angel. He had 48 prior convictions mainly from when he was a teenager for burglary, theft, cannabis offenses, uh, two of possessing an offensive weapon, one of assault when he was 16. 
Um, there is an article where he is interviewed and he talks about the assault in particular and he's talking about like a bar fight that happened when he was 16 out, out in front of a pub somewhere. Um, it doesn't seem, I mean, despite the fact that yes, he has kind of a lengthy rap sheet, especially for his age, this guy's only 26 years old at this time. Um, none of it seems to be anything that I would believe would put him in the category of being a murderer, uh, particularly of, of two people. Um, that's not saying that he didn't do it. I'm just saying that based on the charges that I've been reading about, based on his input about that one fight that happened when he's 16, it just does not seem like he uh, would naturally be a fit for that type of person. So outside of the boat, we also have the mystery man that was sighted. Um, people noted him in the bar, and Guy Wallace, the taxi boat driver, um, actually noted a man with very similar features to these pictures. As a matter of fact, one of these identikits down here, I think it's this one on the left. Uh, yeah, this is the one that was created by Guy Wallace. Uh, he wasn't real happy with how he came out. He said the hair should have been longer, not as straight, and that the eyes didn't seem right to him. This is another identikit that was done from someone that was working at the bar that supposedly saw this man. And this is kind of a newer picture that was done, once again, based off information from Guy Wallace. But if we compare that all to Scott, and here is a picture of Scott, um, something that was frequent was they were saying that uh, he had really hard stubble, of course the length of his hair. If we look in this picture here, Scott looks relatively clean shaven. You can say he's got a little stubble on his upper lip, but nothing really around his chin or his jawline. And his hair um, is nowhere near this length. As a matter of fact, his hair is completely uh, short and close cropped, as you can see in this photo here. So how the police go from this type of description to pegging it to uh, Scott Watson is a little bit of a twisty story. Guy Wallace, um, his description seemed to change a little bit by the time the court case came around and then he retracted that. Someone else that worked in the bar said that she felt like she was being led very heavily by law enforcement to give the information the way that they were presenting it. Uh, and then she later retracted that. You have two jailhouse confessions where other inmates are saying that Scott actually admitted to them that he did it. Uh, years after the trial, one of those people contacted a newspaper and said that was all fiction. Uh, I was basically in a bad spot. I needed some help getting through that, so I told the officers what they wanted to hear. The second one was a person who didn't even share a cell with Scott and it was later found out that he was apparently compensated in some way, given at least a cell phone and possibly a car as well for his participation in that case. Um, I've never quite heard of things like this. And it's strange to me because admissions like that, I believe here in the States, would fall under hearsay. I don't think that testimony would even be allowed in court, but uh, particularly during an appeals process where Scott was trying to get this case reopened, um, those two inmate confessions were brought up again as being evidence to basically keep him in, in jail, which doesn't make a lot of sense when you hear about the aftermath of those confessions. This picture is also key because um, they showed it to Guy Wallace, and I kind of disagree with the method that they, they used around this. First of all, you'll notice that Scott's eyes are only half open in this picture. I've seen another picture from this same exact series and his eyes are fully open. So it's almost like they caught him mid blink. Um, they, originally showed, uh, they originally showed Guy Wallace a lineup, one of those, you know, a bunch of different pictures of, of different men. I think there was six or eight different pictures on there that included Scott and Guy did not recognize him at all. Then they later showed him a different compilation of pictures, including this one, and he noted at that time that the guy's eyes seemed to look like the guy that he remembered um, from the bar and from the boat. And that is where they kind of started leading him towards, well, that's Scott, and you know, uh, leading him to this potentially false identification. What I don't like about that method is there's almost a little subliminal hit that's going on here because they actually showed him a picture of Scott in a separate lineup previous to another lineup where they had this picture of his eyes kind of half closed. And I don't know if 
they realize, but you know, you might be affecting people in their subconscious when you're exposing them to the same person in separate lineups where all of a sudden their memory is kind of gluing that together and saying, oh, I do remember that guy, even though they don't remember him specifically from that event back then. So I really don't like how that was handled. So here at stuff.co.nz is an article that's pretty good about the main points um, that are sticky in this case. The identification of Scott Watson. Um, police showed Wallace photographs of Watson. He did not recognize him. A month later, he was shown a montage including a photo of Watson with his eyes half closed. This time, Wallace did pick Watson out saying the eyes were correct, but that the hair was too short and he looked too tidy. Wallace now disowned it entirely. Scott Watson was, quote, definitely not the man he took in the water taxi that night. Point two, the mystery yacht. Guy Wallace says he dropped his passengers off at a two-masted catch, not the single-masted sloop blade. He gave a detailed description of a yacht much longer and higher than the blade, with ropes draped about the stern and a distinctive blue stripe along the hull with large brass portals. Something extremely unfortunate um, for Scott in this case is after he left the marina, he, according to him, he just got up the next morning after he slept off his, his hangover. Um, I do think it's worth noting he was being pretty lewd. He was trying to find a woman to sleep with. When he got back to his boat, the Blade, he apparently uh, had been tied off with a few other boats and he was going onto those boats trying to find women. Um, definitely, I'm, I'm telling you guys, he's, he's no angel, but I don't know if he is, uh, if he's really the culprit in all of this either. But in a pretty unfortunate twist for him, uh, the next morning he decided to go to a friend of his. Uh, he took his boat out and he was going to repaint it. And he wound up actually painting it blue, the same color that everyone was looking for this mystery ship that was blue. Now, uh, he had talked about doing this for a while. His friend was giving him the paint, so they were able to backtrace all that information and see that he had planned on doing that for a considerable time. Um, I think it's just an unfortunate occurrence. It doesn't really tie into the case much because the police are doubting the validity of the blue stripe altogether. Um, as a matter of fact, I have a picture here. Let me show you. This is from the information that Casey Jane sent to me. This is a mock-up of the mystery catch, kind of the type of boat that they're said to be looking for that all these witnesses said that they saw. And then down here we have a picture of Scott's boat and you can see um, it's a bit hard to tell the size difference but it is much smaller. It's maybe just a little bit more than half the size of this type of catch. You can see the portals in the side here and how you couldn't even really have portals in the side of this with how low it sits in the water. Um, not to mention, pretty big difference when you have a red painted cabin versus uh, a blue stripe that's running on the side of the boat. So some pretty drastic differences going on there. Two other passengers, Hayden Morrissey and Sarah Dyer, also testified the taxi had not gone to the Blade, but another much bigger yacht. And Ted and Yvonne Walsh, two experienced boaties, described seeing a similarly large yacht in Endeavor Inlet on New Year's Eve. They too talked about the blue stripe and the ropes. Bruce O'Malley gave a similar description. And the Walshes saw the catch in Queen Charlotte Sound the day after Ben and Olivia disappeared. Edward reported seeing a, quote, youngish Caucasian female with long blonde hair sitting next to a young man with short cropped hair. So here we're even getting potentially a sighting of Olivia and Ben um, following them going to this boat. But once again, this information isn't really acted on because it doesn't seem to be fitting with the scope of the police investigation. The timing and the two trip theory. Another water taxi driver, Donald Anderson, says he took Scott Watson to his boat in the early hours of New Year's Day Watson, who does not wear a watch, told police he thought it was about 2 a.m. I'm not exactly sure. Anderson was vague about the timing and other aspects of the trip. Um, this is strange to me because I've seen in several places where um, basically Scott is saying he was taken back to his boat by a water taxi, but he was the only person in the water taxi when he was taken back to his boat. Here we have Donald Anderson saying, He's the person that took Scott. And in another article I found, 
there is another water taxi driver that is um, being talked about as being the person that could have taken Scott back. And that is a gentleman named John Mullen. So quite honestly, I don't know what way to think on this, but what is clear is Scott says he rode back. He was the only person in the boat. We have two water taxi drivers that seem to claim taking Scott specifically to his ship blade. And we have Guy Wallace saying he did not take Scott and he definitely didn't take Scott to blade. It's, uh, I don't know. It's, I, I really can't believe that they even made a case with all this conflicting testimony. But back to the two trip theory. The trip is a critical issue. If Watson was back on his boat and did not return to shore, he could not have been the man whom Guy Wallace took with Ben and Olivia to a yacht at 3.30 or 4 a.m. So he could not be the murderer. However, Watson was definitely ashore at 3 a.m. because he was involved in an ugly incident at that time with 17-year-old Ollie Perkins who was wearing his sister's necklace. Watson's presence on shore at this time is not disputed. Apparently, he was making fun of this guy for wearing this feminine-looking necklace. Uh, the guy was wearing it because his sister was supposedly battling cancer. He was wearing it in her honor. That turned into a bit of a scuffle between these two guys. There are several witnesses to this scuffle, so they had pretty good indicators of the time around that happening. So that puts Scott back at the bar. We know sometime between 3 a.m. and 3.30 a.m., uh, that conflicts a little bit with his testimony because he thought he was taken back to his boat somewhere around two, but he admits he, he's not the type of guy to wear a watch. He actually goes into this in depth in an interview that he does. Uh, it's just not his type of lifestyle. He thinks that it compartmentalizes people, puts you in boxes, I think is how he described it. So could he be off by the timing there? It appears that he is because we have numerous witnesses that saw this scuffle. This suggests two possibilities. Either Watson's guess of 2 a.m. was much too early and he in fact returned to his boat after the 3 a.m. altercation, or he indeed returned to the boat at 2 a.m., but returned to shore between then and 3 a.m. Prosecutor Davidson argued in his summing up to the jury that Watson must have returned to shore after his earlier trip to the Blade. How he did so was not important. It was, quote, a short row to the shore and quote, does it matter? Now this, a lot of people that analyze the case say was the defining thing that really locked in his guilty uh, verdict. And what's strange about that is this isn't factual. Um, it is almost as if the prosecution was using reasonable doubt to, to all of a sudden create a case for this man being guilty. And I have never quite seen the justice system inverted and reasonable doubt used in that direction. It's, from what I understand, it's not supposed to be used in that direction. It should still infer that there is some more explanation that is needed. Now this was highly criticized because during the actual trial, this was not brought up, this whole true two-trip theory. This was brought up only in closing arguments. So the defense really didn't have any opportunity to counter those claims, to try to bring in evidence against that claim. It was just tagged on at the very end of uh, these court proceedings. And apparently it was kind of a trick and it worked. It did the trick. It got this guy uh, convicted. The other thing about this two-trip theory is uh, it doesn't really make sense when you consider the time frames that they've built up from other people that had witnessed uh, Scott getting back to his boat that night. Remember I told you he went to those neighboring boats and was kind of bugging people looking for women? Uh, those accounts say that they happened somewhere between three and four. So uh, it doesn't really make sense if he was there with Olivia and Ben that he's going to put them on his boat and then he's going to go looking for women and people aren't going to notice the fact that there are other people on his boat. One of these women was so disturbed by him that apparently she was up for an hour and out there it is extremely quiet. So it would have been likely that she would have heard conversation going on with these people, um, particularly if something else was happening, she would probably have heard that as well. And in terms of the, tr the two trip theory, uh, how does he now have enough time to get back to shore, to jump back on a water taxi, to come back out after he's already disturbed his neighbors somewhere between 3 and 4 a.m.? 
Um, it doesn't really hold up for me. The, the time frames on this all seem wacky. Um, and outside of that, the two-trip theory also supposes that he somehow got back to shore. Wouldn't that have been another ride on a water taxi? Wouldn't there be yet again another instance of someone out there remembering, oh, well, I picked him up from Blade and then took him to the shore? There has been no testimony around any of that as well. So um, this was really a piece of finely worded conjecture that wound up uh, being tagged into the end of this court case and apparently did some pretty significant damage to the defense. And then we get to the one piece of physical evidence, Olivia's hair, or actually two pieces. Two hairs, one identified as very likely to be Olivia's, ended up on a rug on Watson's yacht. The defense says one possible innocent explanation is that in the crowded partying of Ferno Lodge, Olivia's hair was transferred to Watson directly or even via a third person and then left on the rug. Perhaps there was a mix-up of the hairs at the ESR laboratory. ESR's record is not unblemished and there was an unexplained one centimeter long cut in the plastic bag that contains hairs taken as reference samples from Olivia's bedroom. Finally, there is the possibility that the hairs were planted. Now, I've seen some information on this that they actually analyzed this blanket. It's known as the tiger blanket. And they pulled 400 hairs from it. All of them were dark. None of them seemed to be a match. Certainly not for Olivia, but I didn't see any analysis about them even potentially being a match for Ben. Um, then a few weeks later, the same technician is working with the bag of Olivia's known hair that was taken from her hairbrush. This bag does have a cut in the bottom of it. She's apparently reviewing this on the same table and that same day re-examines the hair that was taken from the tiger blanket. So the thought that there was some type of contamination crossover uh, is pretty significant and in the recent documentary that they did on this they actually show uh, a clip from court where they're talking to the technician about the possibility of contamination and she pretty much openly says yes it's very, it's very possible that that could have happened because um, she's not sure how the cut in the bottom of the bag happened so was it planted in there I don't necessarily think so. Um, to me, the possibility that it was contamination that happened in the laboratory is pretty high. Uh, outside of that, another piece of physical evidence that came off the boat was there is a hatch to get to down into the deck of his boat, and that hatch has a foam insulation kind of on the bottom side of it, and there were scratch, scratch marks all over that foam insulation. The police assume that Olivia was scratching the foam insulation trying to get out. Um, now there's a few problems with that assumption. Apparently the scratch marks go beyond the edge. You know, this is a hatch that fits uh, over a hole and the scratch marks go beyond the edge that would have been exposed if you were on the inside of it. Uh, outside of that, apparently they asked Scott and I think his sister about this and his sister specifically remembers when Scott's uh, nieces were visiting him on the boat and they were whacking at that thing with a stick and they had caused all of those scratches on that piece of foam. Outside of that, Scott talks about this very plainly in his interview. Um, he says, why would she be scratching at that latch or at, the, at that hatch? There's no way to lock it. Um, typically when he has to batten it down, if he's inside, he has a little piece of rope that he just slinks around and that's what keeps it closed. Um, there is no locking mechanism from the outside for it. Outside of that, if you're in the cabin, he said there was plenty of devices in there for people to defend themselves. He did have an old machete that was under one of his seats. Um, he had tools that were in there. There was all kinds of different stuff to, to you know, mount some kind of defense. And that really brings me to the main point that is missing in all this. Where is the blood evidence? Um, in the confessions that were supposedly brought in by the inmates, uh, supposedly he had told them that he strangled uh, Olivia. In another confession that had happened, in a book that was recently written about this, there is a supposed other confession that Scott made to a friend of his, though this friend goes unnamed in this actual publication. 
and that friend was told that uh, he wound up stabbing both of them. There should be some type of trace evidence, particularly if those people were stabbed. Uh, they should have found blood somewhere inside that cabin. Now, there has been some talk of the cabin being washed. That is also debated because it is only approximately 30% of the surfaces in there that look like they were wiped down. Scott has a reasonable answer for this. He talks about salt water uh, getting into his cabin and that it degrades items really badly. So he is pretty good about trying to wipe those things down. Um, also, if you know about forensics and you know about particularly about them finding blood, uh, wiping things down doesn't really do the trick for getting rid of blood evidence. Uh, it takes quite a bit more work than that. And if there is any type of significant spillage or splatter going on, you're not going to get it all. They'll, they're going to be able to find some. And in this case, they didn't. Uh, it hinged on two hairs in terms of physical evidence. There's no body. There's no murder weapon. None of that has been even theorized or identified. And in another twist in this case, Gerald Hope, father of murdered Blyneim teenager Olivia Hope, wants to know why it has taken three years to forensically test a skull retrieved from the mouth of the Waimakariri River near Christchurch. Uncovered by a fishing trawler in 1999, the skull was originally thought to have belonged to one of two fishermen who had gone missing in the area. Later tests showed that it belonged instead to a Pakaha woman in her late teens or early 20s. Wasn't sure what Pakaha meant, so I had to look it up. That means a white New Zealander. Um, yeah, so a little interesting. Here we have a skull popping up, and I haven't been able, and Casey also looked into this, we haven't been able to find any update on this information outside of what's on this page. Um, down below, you'll see that they did contact uh, two local police departments asking them for missing person cases that would match a female skull of approximately that age. One of the police departments said, Olivia Hope, that's the only case we have on file that would match this. And the other police department said they have no cases that would match this. Um, so is there a chance that that skull does belong to Olivia? This was found way back in the early 2000s, I think 2002 or 2003. Uh, I'm really not sure. I think that information would have probably come out by now, but testing on this skull is tough. There is no matter on it outside of the skull. Even the teeth are missing, so you can't really do a dental comparison on this. Um, so I'm really not certain. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any way to, to close that part out. And just to flip this search the other way, I did run a search on Scott Watson is guilty just to see what would come up. And there does appear to be a book written by Ian Weishart, who, in an interesting turn, had previously written a book about Scott being innocent, and now he has written a book about Scott being guilty. Hey, that's a great way to make sure you can sell your book to everyone, isn't it? Um, he wrote this article at investigatemagazine.co.nz, which I believe he also runs. Um, and... It seems to be in response to critics of his book, and it is an attempt to go through and prove that Scott is indeed guilty. Um, what's strange about this article, and I'll have it down below so you can check it out for yourself, is it, it, it claims that a lot of people when they look into this case are cherry picking facts so that it matches their argument. Um, but then if you read through what he does in the rest of this article, he cherry picks facts to essentially match his argument, and he hinges all of it specifically on the boat ride. Um, I don't know that that's the best way to view this case. At the start of this episode, I told you, I asked you, you know, do you uh, get frustrated when you see people arguing about semantics and getting off the point? That is where this article goes for me. I have read it twice. I have gone into the details and tried to find independent sources for the claims that he's making in this. Unfortunately, I can't. I assume that he wants me to buy his book so that I can find these sources. Um, quite honestly, this argument does not hold up very strongly for me as well. He seems to be coming from an extremely defensive position and there's almost no independent information going on here. Apparently, his new book was also written once he got access to police files that was leaked to him by someone that it was that those files were given to. 
Um, he doesn't seem to question the authenticity or validity of those files. Uh, you know, even when I bump into things, I'm, almost, I'm always sure to tell you guys, I don't know if these are valid. Maybe I feel like they're valid, but I don't know that I would write a book off information like that unless I could certainly verify that that information was valid and had been unaltered, which unfortunately, uh, with modern technology, it is really easy to take things that are legit, maybe alter them to inject your own cherry-picked facts and make things look a certain way. Um, so, outside of his argument, I can't really find too many other people um, that are defending the position well, at least, that Scott is truly guilty. I can't find any specific facts. And really, it comes back to the point of, we don't have the bodies, we don't have a murder weapon, we don't have a method, we have all kinds of people telling stories and then later retracting their information. Um, this, this case is just, it's horrible. It's horrible to look at because the truth of it is two people are missing. The police might have never been looking in the right direction. They got a conviction and then they put that case closed. And the truth of the matter might be that the murderer is still out there somewhere. That boat is still probably out there somewhere. Um, that's one thing that strikes me about this. Despite the fact that no one has showed photographic proof of that boat, which I really think is, is a tough thing to get over when you consider this is New Year's Eve. But let's put that aside. You have dozens of witnesses coming forward saying that they saw that specific boat. It would have been a much stronger position for the prosecution and for the police investigation if they identified that boat, if they questioned that person, and if they ruled them out. We don't know what that boat is. We don't know its name. We don't know if it even has someone that was living on it or working on it that looks like the person in those identikit pictures. That, that alone is enough reasonable doubt for me to think that Scott should have probably not been convicted of this crime. Does that necessarily mean he's, he's innocent? No. Just for me personally, there is far too much reasonable doubt because that investigation did not close that hoop, a very, very big hoop of the boat, the mystery catch. But what do you guys think? This is a big one. There's a lot of information out there, so please uh, start with what I've added in the description box below. If you find more information, share it with the rest of us here in the comments. Um, I just, I don't know where to, where to go with this one. The tragedy is, there might be two tragedies going on here. The tragedy is, we don't know what happened to Ben and Olivia, and it has been decades at this point. Are we ever going to know? I really, I'm not sure. But the second tragedy is, we might have a man that has been incarcerated, and he might actually not be guilty of the crime. And that, that is, uh, that's almost as bad as killing someone. Maybe not necessarily the same, but taking away their freedom, stuffing them in a cell, and let, leaving them there to rot, uh, that's really tough. The other weird aspect about this is, even though um, he can now file his appeals and he can go to the parole board and try to request uh, you know, being let go at some point, uh, that's not likely to happen unless he admits guilt. And from what we've seen, it doesn't look like he's going to be admitting guilt to this anytime soon. So he is really in a catch-22, and I don't see uh, how he gets out of that. It's a tough one. Well, thank you, Brain Scratchers. I know this was a bit of a lengthy one, but thank you for hanging out with me today. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. I'll catch you on the next show on the Lord Narch channel. Take care.